the witches frolic Richard Harris Barham scene, the snuggery at Tappington. Grandpapa in a high-backed cane-bottomed elbow chair of carved walnut tree, dozing. His nose at an angle of 45 degrees, his thumb slowly performed the rotatory motion described by lexicographers as twiddling. The hop of the family astride on a walking stick, with burnt cork mustachios, and a pheasant's tail pinned in his cap, solaceth himself with martial music. Roused by a strain of surpassing dissonance, Grand Plipoliquiter. Come hither, come hither, my little boy Ned. Come hither unto my knee I cannot away with that horrible din, that sixpenny drum, and that trumpet of tin. Oh, better to wander frank and free through the fair of good Saint Bartlemy, than list to such awful minstrelsy. Now lay, little Ned, those nesances by, and I'll read ye a lay of grammary. Grand Pliparisseth, yawneth like the crater of an extinct volcano, proceedeth slowly to the window, and apostrophizeth the abbey in the distance. I love thy tower, grey ruin, I joy thy form to see, though reft of all, cell, cloister, and hall, nothing is left save a tottering wall, that, awfully grand and darkly dull, threatened to fall and demolish my skull, as, ages ago, I wandered along careless thy grass-grown courts among, in sky-blue jacket and trousers laced, the latter uncommonly short in the waist. Thou art dearer to me, thou ruin grey, than the squire's veranda over the way. And fairer, I ween, the ivy sheen of thy mouldering turret binds, than the alderman's house about half a mile off, with the green Venetian blinds. Full many a tale would my grandam tell, in many a bygone day, of darksome deeds, which of old befell in thee, thou ruin grey. And other readiest ear would lend, and stare like frightened pig, while my grandfather's hair would have stood up an end, had he not worn a wig. One tale I remember of Mickle Dread now life and listen, my little boy Ned. Thou mayest have read, my little boy Ned, though thy mother thine idlest blames, in Dr. Goldsmith's history book, of a gentleman called King James, in quilted doublet, and great trunk breeches, who held in abhorrence tobacco and witches. Well, in King James's golden days, for the days were golden then, they could not be less, for good Queen Bess had died aged three score and ten, and her days, we know, were all of them so. While the court poets sung, and the court gallants swore that the days were as golden still as before. Some people, tis true, a troublesome few, who historical points would unsettle, have lately thrown out a sort of a doubt of the genuine ring of the metal. But who can believe to a monarch so wise people would dare tell a parcel of lies? Well, then, in good King James's days, golden or not does not matter a jot, you unruin a sort of a roof had got. For though, repairs lacking, its walls had been cracking since Harry the Eighth sent its friars a-packing, though joists, and floors, and windows, and doors had all disappeared, yet pillars by scores remained, and still propped up a ceiling or two, while the belfry was almost as good as new. You are not to suppose matters looked just so in the ruins some two hundred years ago. Just in that far thermos angle, where you see the remains of a winding stair, one turret especially high in air up reared its tall gaunt form, as if defying the power of fate, or the hand of time the innovator. And though to the pitiless storm its weaker brethren all around bowing, in ruin had strewed the ground, alone it stood, while its fellows lay strewed, like a four-bottle man in a company, screwed not firm on his legs, but by no means subdued. One night, twas in 1606 I like when I can, Ned, the date to fix, the month was May, though I can't well say at this distance of time the particular day but oh, that night, that horrible night. Folks ever afterwards said with a fright that they never had seen such a terrible sight. The sun had gone down fiery red, and if that evening he laid his head in Thetis's lap beneath the seas, he must have scalded the goddess's knees. He left behind him a lurid track of blood red light upon clouds so black, that Warren and Hunt, with the whole of their crew, could scarcely have given them a darker hue. There came a shrill and a whistling sound, above, beneath, beside, and around, yet leaf ne'er moved on tree. So that some people thought old Beelzebub must have been locked out of doors, and was blowing the dust from the pipe of his street door key. And then a hollow moaning blast came, sounding more dismally still than the last, and the lightning flashed, 
and the thunder growled, and louder and louder the tempest howled, and the rain came down in such sheets as would stagger a bard for a simile short of Niagara. Rob Gilpin was a citizen, but, though of some renown, of no great credit in his own, or any other town. He was a wild and roving lad, forever in the alehouse boozing, or romping, which is quite as bad, with female friends of his own choosing. And Rob this very day had made, not dreaming such a storm was brewing, an assignation with Miss Slade, their trysting place this same grey ruin. But Gertrude Slade became afraid, and to keep her appointment unwilling, when she spied the rain on her window pane in drops as big as a shilling. She put off her hat and her mantle again, he'll never expect me in all this rain. But little he recks of the fears of the sex, or that maiden falls to her tryst could be. He had stood there a good half hour or yet commenced that perilous shower, alone by the trysting tree. Robin looks east, Robin looks west, but he sees not her whom he loves the best. Robin looks up, and Robin looks down, but no one comes from the neighboring town. The storm came at last, loud roared the blast, and the shades of evening fell thick and fast. The tempest grew, and the straggling yew, his leafy umbrella, was wet through and through. Rob was half dead with cold and with fright, when he spies in the ruins a twinkling light a hop, two skips, and a jump, and straight Rob stands within that postern gate. And there were gossips sitting there, by one, by two, by three, two were an old ill-favored pair. But the third was young, and passing fair, with laughing eyes and with coal-black hair. A dainty quin was she. Rob would have given his ears to sip but a single salute from her cherry lip. As they sat in that old and haunted room, in each one's hand was a huge birch broom, on each one's head was a steeple-crowned hat, on each one's knee was a coal-black cat. Each had a kirtle of Lincoln green it was, I trow, a fearsome scene. No riddle me, riddle me right, match gray, what foot unhallowed winds this way? Goody price, goody price, now a read me your eight, who roams the old ruins this drearisome night? Then up and spake that sunsequan. And she spake both loud and clear, Oh, be it for weal, or be it for woe, enter friend, or enter foe, Rob Gilpin is welcome here. No tread we a measure. A howl. A howl. Now tread we a measure. Quoth she the heart of Robin beat thick and throbbing roving Rob, tread a measure with me. A, lassie. Quoth Rob, as her hand he gripes, though Satan himself were blowing the pipes. Now around they go and around, and around, with hop skip and jump, and frolics and bound, such sailing and gilding, such sinking and sliding, such lofty curvetting, and grand pirouetting. Ned, you would swear that Monsieur Gilbert and Miss Taglioni were capering there. And oh! Such awful music! Ne'er fell sound so uncanny on mortal ear, there were the tones of a dying man's groans mixed with the rattling of dead men's bones, had you heard the shrieks, and the squeals, and the squeaks, you'd not have forgotten the sound for weeks. And around, and around, and around they go, heel to heel, and toe to toe, prance and caper, curvette and wheel, toe to toe, and heel to heel. Tis merry, tis merry, comers, I trow, to dance thus beneath the nightshade bough. Goody price, goody price, now riddle me right, where may we sup this frolicsome night? Mine host of the dragon hath mutton and veal. The squire hath partridge, and widgeon, and teal. But old Sir Thopas hath daintier cheer, a pasty made of the good red deer, a huge grouse pie, and a fine Florentine, a fat roast goose, and a turkey and chine. Match gray, match gray, now tell me, I pray, where's the best wassail bowl to a round delay? There is ale in the cellars of Tappington Hall, but the squire is a churl, and his drink is small. Mine host of the dragon hath many a flagon of double ale, lamb's wool, and eau de vie, but Sir Thopas, the vicar, hath costlier liquor, a butt of the choicest Malvoisy. He doth not lack canary or sack, and a good pint stoop of clary wine smacks merrily off with a turkey and chine. No away. And away. Without delay, hey quackalorum. My broomstick gay, we must be back ere the dawn of the day, hey up the chimney. Away. Away. Old Goody Price mounts in a trice, in showing her legs she is not over nice. Old Goody Jones, all skin and bones, 
follows like winking. Away go the crones, knees and nose in a line with the toes, sitting their brooms like so many duck rows. Latest and last the damsel passed, one glance of her coal black as she cast. She laughed with glee loud laughter's furry, dost fear, Rob Gilpin, to ride with me. Oh, never mind man unscathed espy one single glance from that coal black eye. Away she flew. Without more ado Rob seizes and mounts on a broomstick to, hey, up the chimney, lass. Hey after you. It's a very fine thing on a fine day in June to ride through the air in a Nassau balloon. But you'll find very soon, if you aim at the moon in a carriage like that you're a bit of a spoon, for the largest can't fly above twenty miles high, and you're not halfway then on your journey, nor nigh. While no man alive could ever contrive, Mr. Green has declared, to get higher than five. And the soundest philosophers hold that, perhaps, if you reach twenty miles your balloon would collapse, or pass by such action the sphere of attraction, getting into the track of some comet good lack. Tis a thousand to one that you'd never come back. And the boldest of mortals a danger like that must fear, and be cautious of getting beyond our own atmosphere. No, no. When I try a trip to the sky, I shan't go in that thing of yours, Mr. G.Y.E., though Messrs. Monk Mason, and Spencer, and Beasley, all join in saying it travels so easily. No. There's nothing so good as a pony of wood not like that which, of late, they stuck up on the gate at the end of the park, which caused so much debate, and gave so much trouble to make it stand straight, but a regular broomstick you'll find that the favorite, above all, when, like Robin, you haven't to pay for it. Stay really I dread I am losing the thread of my tail, and it's time you should be in your bed, so life now, and listen, my little boy Ned. The vicarage walls are lofty and thick, and the copings are stone, and the sides are brick. The casements are narrow, and bolted and barred, and the stout oak door is heavy and hard. Moreover, by way of additional guard, a great big dog runs loose in the yard, and a horseshoe is nailed on the threshold sill, to keep out of that savors of ill, but, Alec. The chimney pot's open still. That great big dog begins to quail, between his hind legs he drops his tail, crouched on the ground, the terrified hound gives vent to a very odd sort of a sound. It is not a bark, loud, open, and free, as an honest old watchdog's bark should be. It is not a yelp, it is not a growl, but a something between a whine and a howl. And, hark! A sound from the window high response to the watchdog's pitiful cry, it is not a moan, it is not a groan. It comes from the nose, but is not what the nose produces in healthy and sound repose. Yet Sirth opens the vicar is fast asleep and his respirations are heavy and deep. He snores, tis true, but he snores no more as he's I been accustomed to snore before, and as men of his kidney are wont to snore. Sirth opens his weight is sixteen stone for. He draws his breath like a man distressed by pain or grief, or like one oppressed by some ugly old incubus perched on his breast. A something seems to disturb his dreams, and thrice on his ear, distinct and clear. Falls a voice as of somebody whispering near in still small accents, faint and few, hey down the chimney pot. Hey after you. Throughout the vicarage, near and far, there is no lack of bolt or of bar, plenty of locks to closet and box, yet the pantry wicket is standing ajar. And the little low door, through which you must go, down some half dozen steps, to the cellar below, is also unfastened, though no one may know, by so much as a guess. How it comes to be so? For wicket and door, the evening before, were both of them locked, and the key safely placed on the bunch that hangs down from the housekeeper's waist. Oh! Twas a jovial sight to view in that snug little cellar that frolics and crew. Old Goody Price had got something nice, a turkey pulled larded with bacon and spice. Old Goody Jones would touch naught that had bones, she might just as well mumble a parcel of stones. Goody Jones, in sooth, had got never a tooth, and a new college pudding of marrow and plums is the dish of all others that soothed her gums. Madge Gray was picking the breast of a chicken, her coal black eye, with its glance so sly, was fixed on Rob Gilpin himself, sitting by with his heart full of love, and his mouth full of pie. Grouse pie, with hair in the middle, is fair which, duly concocted with science and care, 
Dr. Kitchener says, is beyond all compare. And a tender lever at Robin had never ate. So, in after times, oft he was wont to assay verate. No pledge with the wine cup. A health. A health. Sweet are the pleasures obtained by stealth. Fill up. Fill up. The brim of the cup is the part that I holdeth the tooth so must sup. Here's to thee, Goody Price. Goody Jones, to thee. To thee, moving Rob. And again to me. Many a sip, never a slip come to us for twixt the cup and the lip. The cups pass quick, the toasts fly thick. Rob tries in vain at their meaning to pick, but here's the word scratch, an old bogey, and nick. More familiar groan, now he stands up alone, volunteering to give them a toast of his own. A bumper of wine. Fill thine. Fill mine. Here's a health to old Noah who planted the vine. Oh then what sneezing, what coughing and wheezing, ensued in a way that was not over-pleasing. Goody Price, Goody Jones and the pretty Madge Grey, all seemed as their liquor had gone the wrong way. But the best of the joke was, the moment he spoke those words, which the party seemed almost to choke, as by mentioning Noah some spell had been broke, every soul in the house at that instant awoke. And, hearing the din from barrel and bin, drew at once the conclusion that thieves had got in. Up jumped the cook and caught hold of her spit. Up jumped the groom and took bridle and bit. Up jumped the gardener and shouldered his spade. Up jumped the scullion, the footman, the maid. The two last, by the way, occasioned some scandal, by appearing together with only one candle, which gave for unpleasant surmises some handle. Up jumped the swineherd, and up jumped the big boy, a nondescript under him, acting as pig boy. Butler, housekeeper, coachman from bottom to top everybody jumped up without parley or stop with the weapon which first in their way chanced to drop, whip, warming pan, wig block, mug, musket and mop. Last of all doth appear, with some symptoms of fear, Sirth Opus in person to bring up the rear, in a mixed kind of costume, half pontificalibus, half what scholars denominate pure naturalibus. Nay, the truth to express, as you leasily guess, they have none of them time to attend much to dress. But he or she, as the case may be, he or she seizes what he or she pleases, trunk hosen or kirtles, and shirts or chemises. And thus one and all, great and small, short and tall, muster at once in the vicarage hall, with upstanding locks, starting eyes, shortened breath, like the folks in the gallery scene in Macbeth, when Macduff is announcing their sovereign's death. And hark! What accents clear and strong, to the listening throng come floating along. Tis Robin encaring himself in a song very good song. Very well sung. Jolly companions everyone. On, on to the cellar. Away. Away. On, on, to the cellar without more delay. The whole posse rush onwards in battle array. Conceive the dismay of the party so gay, old Goody Jones, Goody Price, and Madge Gray, when the door bursting wide, they descried the allied troops, prepared for the onslaught. Rolling like a tide, and the spits, and the tongs, and the pokers beside. Boot and saddles the word. Mount, comers, and ride. Alarm was ne'er caused more strong and indigenous by cats among rats, or a hoke in a pigeon house. Quick from the view away they all flew, with a yell, and a screech, and a halabaloo, hey up the chimney. Hey after you. The Volsons themselves made an exit less speedy from Corioli fluttered like doves by Macready. They're gone, save one, Robin alone. Robin, whose high state of civilization precludes all idea of arrostation, and who now has no notion of more locomotion than suffices to kick, with much zeal and devotion, right and left at the party, who pounced on their victim, and mauled him, and kicked him, and licked him, and pricked him, as they bore him away scarce aware what was done, and believing it all but a part of the fun, Hick hick coughing out the same strain he'd begun, Joel jolly companions everyone. Morning great scarce bursts into day or at Tappington Hall there's the deuce to pay. The tables and chairs are all placed in array in the old oak parlor, and in and out domestics and neighbors, a motley rout, are walking, and whispering, and standing about. And the squire is there in his large armchair, 
leaning back with a grave magisterial air. In the front of his seat a huge volume, called Fleta, and Bracton, both tomes of an old-fashioned look, and Coke upon Littleton, then a new book. And he moistens his lips with occasional sips from a luscious sack posset that smiles in a tankard close by on a side table not that he drank hard, but because at the day, I hardly need say, the hung merchants had not yet invented how kwa, nor as yet would you see so kong or bahia at the tables of persons of any degree, how our ancestors managed to do without tea I must fairly confess is a mystery to me. Yet your light gates and chaucers had no cups and saucers. Their breakfast, in fact, and the best they could get, was a sort of a day genre a grave la fourchette. Instead of our slopes they had cutlets and chops, and sack poissets, and ale and stoops, tankards, and pots. And they wound up the meal with rump steaks and shallots. Now the squire lifts his hand with an air of command, and gives them a sign, which they all understand, to bring in the culprit. And straightway the carter and huntsman drag in that unfortunate martyr, still kicking, and crying, Come, what are you utter? The charge is prepared, and the evidence clear, single quote he was caught in the cellar drinking the beer. And came there, there's very great reason to fear, with companions, to say but the least of them, queer. Such as witches, and creatures with horrible features, and horrible grins, and hooked noses and shins, who'd been playing the deuce with his reverence's bins. The face of his worship grows graver and graver, as the parties detail Robin's shameful behavior. Mr. Buzzard, the clerk, while the tale is reciting, sits down to reduce the affair into writing, with all proper diction, and do legal fiction. Vise, that he, the said prisoner, as clearly was shown, conspiring with folks to deponents unknown, with diverse, that is to say, two thousand, people, in two thousand hats, each hat peat like a steeple, with force and with arms, and with sorcery and charms, upon two thousand brooms entered four thousand rooms. To wit, two thousand pantries, and two thousand cellars, put in bodily fear twenty thousand indwellers, and with sundry, that is to say, two thousand, forks, drew diverse, that is to say, ten thousand, corks, and, with malice perpense, down their two thousand throttles, emptied various, that is to say, ten thousand, bottles. All in breach of the peace, moved by Satan's malignity, and in spite of King James, and his crown, and his dignity. At words so profound Rob gazes around, but no glance sympathetic to cheer him is found. No glance, did I say? Yes, one. Match Gray. She is there in the midst of the crowd standing by and she gives him one glance from her coal-black eye, one touch to his hand, and one word to his ear, that's a line which I've stolen from Sir Walter, I fear, while nobody near seems to see her or hear. As his worship takes up, and surveys with a strict eye the broom now produced as the corpus delicti, or his fingers can clasp, it is snatched from his grasp, the end poked in his chest with a force makes him gasp, and, despite the decorum so due to the quorum, his worship's upset, and so too is his drum. And Madge is astride on the broomstick before him. Hocus pocus. Quick, presto. And hey quacalorum. Mount, mount for your life, Rob. Sir Justice, adieu. Hey up the chimney pot. Hey after you. Through the mystified group, with a halloo and whoop, Madge on the pommel, and Robin and croup, the pair through the air right as if in a chair, while the party below stand mouth open and stare. Clean bump based and amazed, and fixed, all the broomstick, oh! What's gone with Robin, and Madge, and the broomstick? Eh, what's gone ye indeed, Ned? Of what befell Madge Gray, and the broomstick I never heard tell. But Robin was found, that morn, on the ground, in yon old grey ruin again, safe and sound, except that at first he complained much of thirst, and a shocking bad headache, of all ills the worst and close by his near flask you might see, but an empty one, smelling of eau de vie. Rob from the sour is an altered man. He runs home to his lodgings as fast as he can, sticks to his trade, marries Miss Slade, becomes a T.E. Totaler that is the same as T.E. Totalers now, one in all but the name. Grows fond of small beer, which is always a steady sign, never drinks spirits except as a medicine. 
learns to despise cold black eyes, minds pretty girls no more than so many guys, has a family, lives to be sixty, and dies. Now my little boy Ned, brush off to your bed, tie your nightcap on safe, or a napkin instead, or these terrible nights you'll catch cold in your head. And remember my tale, and the moral it teaches, which you'll find much the same as what Solomon preaches. Don't flirt with young ladies. Don't practice soft speeches. Avoid waltzes, quadrilles, pumps, silkos, and knee breeches. Frequent not gray ruins, shun riot and reverie, hocus pocus, and conjuring, and all sorts of devilry. Don't meddle with broomsticks, there be as above switches. Of cellars keep clear, they're the devil's own ditches. And beware of balls, banquetings, brandy, and witches. Above all, don't run after black eyes, if you do, depend on single quote you'll find what I say will come true, old Nick, some fine morning, will hate after you.